Today we have the region director from Palmer Shakes who flew up here from Melbourne, Florida. He's going to talk about how his career started, kind of like John May said, he started at the chicken place. Yep. Um, he started in the warehouse and now he's a region director at Palmer Shakes. It runs the whole southeast area. They have 80 locations in the Americas, North America, Mexico, and Chile, so north all the way through the Americas. And um, Jim is going to tell you his career, so I'm not going to introduce his career. I'm going to tell you a couple of interesting things. He was a volunteer firefighter for a while, which is, which is really cool. And he also had his very first experience last night at Sub Dogs. <laughs> Yeah, and so Jim and Ellen went to Sub Dog. I still haven't been there. I'll have to be there at some point. But they sent pictures, and uh, that's their experience with Greenville so far. And we want to welcome Jim to ECU. Thank you. Everybody hear me through this? So I've got uh, 28 years worth of career to get through, and uh, 45 minutes to do it in, so definitely we'll be talking fast for some points here, but uh, I want to leave time at the end for some questions. So first off, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I feel honored to be uh, here with, with the students. Uh, when Ellen had asked me to do that, she said, uh, you know, you've had a pretty interesting career uh, over the 28 years. Um, that would be really cool to kind of come in and, and talk to the team about it. So. I uh, appreciate you having me. First off, I'll touch on who Polymer Shapes is. So Polymer Shapes is the world's largest plastic distributor for plastic sheet, rod, tube, and film. Uh, like Dr. H said, we do have 80 locations across four countries, Canada, the United States, Mexico, with two down in Chile. Uh, we're about a $600 million company, and we do business with about 37,000 customers across the, uh, across the four countries. Little history as to where polymer shapes came from. In 1946, there were two competing companies, Cadillac Plastic and Commercial Plastic, that started. The thing they had in common was they both sold Lexan sheet. Lexan was produced by General Electric. Uh, they produced the resin to make the sheet. They manufactured the sheet, and then they sold the sheet to distribution, who then sold uh, the product to the end users. In 2000, GE bought Cadillac and Commercial Plastics, so they were fully integrated from residents down to uh, down to the end user. In 2000, the end of 2007, 2008, Sabic had purchased uh, the plastic division from General Electric. Plastics is very volatile. Uh, it's a, it's a volatile market because a lot of the products are petroleum based. So as the price of oil rises and falls, changes a lot of the price bases for the products that we sell. Not, not a good model for GE, so they sold us to Sabic, who was looking, uh, they were really looking for the uh, resin portion of the business, but it was a package deal to take everything on. Sabic was a $55 billion chemical company at the time as well. Uh, in 2016, they spun off the distribution part of the business and were able to sell us to a private uh, family-owned business. So we were back to our roots where we were in the, in the, uh, in the 40s, uh, being privately owned with a shareholder group that we meet with once a year. And in 2021, last year, we celebrated our 75th anniversary. So 76 years this year and, uh, and still going strong. Some of the markets that we serve at uh, Polymer Shapes, uh, that you can see, I'm not gonna run through all of them here, that would take up uh, on the rest of the presentation. So. Uh, touch on a few key ones though, uh, some of the pictures that you see. We uh, sell products, we sell performance plastics to the aerospace industry, so for tray tables, seat backs, windows, uh, the marine business uh, for hatches and uh, cabin doors, um, for bus and rail uh, with COVID that came out, partition became a big thing, as well as some other things like seat backs in, uh, in buses as well. We have a security division that sells uh, bullet-resistant plastics into schools, hospitals, banks, things like that. Heavy equipment, food and beverage, playground equipment, and one of our biggest is uh, the sign and graphic business. So there's uh, waypointing signs everywhere you go in trade shows, hotels, airports. That's some of the stuff that, uh, some of the products that we sell there as well. So, 
my marketing team helped uh, throw together some fun slides uh, for me. I uh, gave them my presentation and they, uh, they threw some, some fun things in together. So, uh, like Dr. H said, I am the Southeast Region Director, aka doer of many things. Over the 28 years of my career, um, I've been involved in, in quite a bit. So, proud story that I'm about to tell you about uh, where I came from. So, uh, first, on a personal side, I was born in 1975, the second of four boys. I grew up in New Jersey, uh, graduated high school. I went to uh, Catholic high school, graduated in 1993. Fall of 1993, I start taking a couple college courses at a local community college, joined the fire department at that same time. So I was going to school during the day, taking a couple business courses, and uh, going to fire school at night. Second semester rolls around and I need to get a job. I need to make some money. So I, uh, I excelled in math, uh, math courses when I was in high school. So otherwise I was a, a pretty average student. So I decided to take the test for New Jersey Turnpike to collect tolls. So it was a math test that I had to take. Um, rapid fire math, pretty simple questions, but the higher you scored, uh, you had to answer more questions to, to get a higher score. That night, I was back at the firehouse and there was another guy there that knew that I was looking for a job that had worked at Cadillac Plastic and asked me to come in. So next day I go in, I interview for a warehouse position there. And that day I was actually offered both jobs. So first decision uh, to make, and now knowing that most tolls are collected electronically, probably uh, a pretty good choice to make at that time. So. April 12th, 1994, I start my career with, uh, with Cadillac Plastic. The first job that I did was I had to tape a product called Thermoclear. It was a fluted material, so air passed through. It was for windows for a building in New York City. And I had to put solid tape on one, tie, one side and vented tape on the other side so condensation didn't build in the sheet. Pretty brainless work, really. Anybody could do it. That job lasted about two months of me just taping, listening to the radio. I mean, it was, it was a pretty, pretty simple job. The rest of that year, I really took advantage of learning all of the other things to do in the warehouse. That's when I learned to run a forklift for the first time, run a large industrial saw, package packages for uh, ground shipments, uh, and, and large packages for truck shipments as well. About a year in, uh, I got my first crack at selling plastic. Uh, my boss saw that it was I could do more than what I was doing. We had a storefront that was attached to the, uh, to the warehouse. So I got my first crack at selling plastic. The advantage that I had over some people that may have started in that position was I had just been handling all the material for the last year. So I knew what broke easy, what didn't, you know, how things slid and things like that. Um, there was really no consequences selling to these customers because they were pretty much homeowners, so I wasn't going to upset a large customer if I, if I made a mistake. <clears throat> the next two years, uh, I was promoted to inside sales, so now handling some customers with some consequences potentially. Uh, customers that were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, but I would also um, I would also still participate in some of the warehouse duties as well. So trying to learn how to do everything and be somebody that was difficult to replace. The uh, two years following that, I got into um, uh, I got into being more of a of an office manager. So I was um, forecasting to the region manager where we were going to finish in sales for the month. I was in charge of buying things uh, for inventory and things like that. Um, then in, uh, well, a little, a little bit of my personal side here to blend that into this. So in 2000, we were going to close our location in Linden and we started this hub and spoke model for Cadillac Plastic. In 1998, I met my wife. We got married in 1999, September 1999. We moved to Pennsylvania because we were closing our Linden, New Jersey facility. So first big decision for me after getting married, wife is pregnant, we moved two hours away. Um, back into inside sales, one of 
uh, five people doing the inside sales job at that time. Um, and just to touch on what the hub and spoke model was, that was a large hub uh, would uh, support the smaller locations around it, so the hub being the large location and then the spokes out to the smaller locations. Um, during that time, um, I really wanted to set myself apart from the other four inside salespeople. I didn't want to just be 20% of the, of the crew there. I wanted to do more. So that's where I really learned how to become a great salesperson. I didn't want to just be a good salesperson. Everybody else in there was pretty good as well. Um, so I developed a way to do things. I developed a cadence. I did the same thing in the morning every day. The first two hours of my day was, was very similar. I went over my open orders, looked at what needed to go for the day, and then I contacted the customers before they contacted me looking for material. So it was, I became somebody that they could rely on. At, uh, we were then, we were sold in 2000 to GE. That's when that whole sale happened. So um, we had, I had started, um, I had started to develop um, more of a, more of a presence as, as somebody that they could count on on the inside. Um, but unfortunately, GE looked at this model and said, this just simply isn't working. So uh, in 2004, we broke apart from the hub and spoke model. My boss at the time was from uh, Southern uh, New Jersey. So he went to go run a struggling Philadelphia location at that time. Um, I had a decision to make at that time because we were closing Harrisburg now. I started thinking, is it me? Yeah, I've worked for two locations that had closed down in four years. Uh, so I could move to Maryland. Um, be inside sales there. I can move to Pittsburgh or I can move to Philadelphia. Uh, and that's where my customer base was going and that's where my boss was going. I came up with a, an in-between and I decided to work for Philadelphia but live in central Pennsylvania. So now I'm driving 97 miles each way. Up at 4 a.m., out of the house by quarter to five, First one to the office at about 6.15, but uh, 90, 90 minutes on the road, I had to make the most of my time, um, you know, being out there. So what was I going to do? I downloaded a lot of books. Podcasting had just really started. I uh, downloaded a lot of college lectures, a lot of history and math, math lectures that I could find. Um, and, yeah, I, I, I drove back and forth uh, each day for at least the first three years as still as an inside salesperson. So definitely wanted to make uh, the most of my time. And uh, so the job was the same. The customer base was pretty much the same for me. But now I'm one of six people in a larger location. So I'm trying to find my way. Um, and it was, it, I kept on doing things the same way that I had done in, in Harrisburg. I kept my cadence about doing things. Um, and in 2007, we were sold to Savick. So that's when that part was a little behind. Was place here, so. Um, so in um, 2007, we're sold, and we've got a new president that comes in. And uh, I just happened to be able to interview for an operations specialist job that we that we were doing at the time. It was a new new position. So I was going to handle some of my key customers, but then I was also going to do scheduling of equipment, saws, uh, truck routes, things like that. But like I said, I never really left that sales part behind. Um, you know, without sales, a, a company has nothing. So I, I always wanted to be um, attached to that sales side of the business as well. Um, still developing a new cadence for this for this job. I would schedule the equipment and the trucks. Being the first one there, my team knew when they got to the office, they knew everything was set up ready to roll. Uh, made their jobs easier, again, being a little bit tougher to replace at that time. Um, but in, so in 2009, um, things get a little tough, so of, uh, going through five years of driving 97 miles each way, um, it's, it's a lot of wear and tear. I drove about 200,000 miles over that time. Expensive. Gas gets up to four bucks a gallon. 
paying tolls, wear and tear on my own car. Something's got to give. Not to mention on the family side, um, we've got two kids now. My wife is home with the kids during the day and then she was working on the weekends. So we didn't see each other that much because I'm up at 4 a.m. I'm home at six, I'm tired. We spend a little bit of time with kids in bed by nine and, and do it all over again. So something had to give at that point um, and I needed a change. Um, got lucky with the position that we were in. I had an outside salesperson that was moving out west that left that position open. My boss at the same time wanted to step down out of that role. So we played some musical chairs. I went into the outside role. My boss stepped into my operations specialist role and we had a new boss that we were reporting to. But, uh, so this was a, a major risk for me uh, doing outside sales because it's a different skill set than inside sales. You're face to face in front of the customer. You really got to plan out your day well. Um, so this was something that I had to adapt to. Um, I'm on the road about four days a week, and the fifth day was an, was an office day, and I got wrapped into a lot of warehouse stuff on the office days, just helping reorganize. So it was causing a lot of stress on me having my schedule done. Um, and about two months in, I remember calling my wife and saying, you know, just, I, I think I made a mistake. This, this job's not for me. Um, but she, she was always supportive and said, you know, well, whatever we need to do, you know, we'll do it. So I just took the opportunity at that point just to uh, get better organized. Um, I had developed a cadence at every other thing that I had done before. So I wanted to do the same thing here. I, I found a way to section off my customers by territory. So I had, had my customer base, but I was also building a target base as well. Um, so I was making the most of my day. My goal was to see seven to eight customers a day. So I would always have a good four or five anchor customers in there while I was throwing in the targets as well. So during that time on the road, I, I did uh, outside sales for the Philadelphia location for two years. SABIC develops this scorecard of how they're going to measure OSRs. Uh, it was based on a bunch of different categories, but it was heavily rewarded on three year in a row success. So it was, it was weighted for uh, people that had done it successfully over time. In the second year, I had made it to the top 10. So I really started making a name for myself as somebody that was pretty good at finding new business um, and selling a wide range of products. So like I said, my wife was very supportive at the time. Um, she still is, um, and we uh, <laughs> more now than ever, right? So, um, and we used to save up. We would take the kids to Disney every other year, every third year, or whatever it was. Um, and we talked about it would be great if something ever opened up in Florida to eventually move to Florida. And in 2011, I decide to make a lateral move. Uh, outside sales position for Orlando opens up. And uh, the, because of the name that I had started making for myself, the job was mine to turn down. So if I wanted it, I could have it. So I moved to Florida in 2011. We had sold our first house that we had bought in 2001, uh, packed up the kids and, and moved down. Um, I get a new boss at that time, a new, new team uh, that they don't know really anything about me, the inside people or the warehouse people at the time. And we had actually gotten a new regional director at that time. So everything was new for me, but the job was the same. So I approached it the same way. Get my core customers together and start looking for uh, the new business. Um, the scorecards kept on going. And in 2013, uh, the reward for the top four on the scorecard was uh, President's Club. You get a free trip, you know, you, it's, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was usually someplace nice. We went down to the Keys um, uh, the first year that I had won. Second year rolls around, more of the same. So this is 2012 at that point. Start off the year, doing great. Top of the scorecard, first couple months. And that's when I was approached by my region director at the time to see about running a location. We had a struggling location down in Miami and um, he wanted to see you know, if, if I could help turn things around. So uh, 
after a couple career discussions with him because I wasn't quick to jump at it. We were, I was having a lot of success doing what I was doing. And, uh, but in 2013, we packed up the kids, sold second house and, and moved to, uh, and moved to Miami. So now I'm running the Miami location. Smaller location had been failing for a couple of years. Um, there were four people there, I made five. So really, for me, going into this location, my approach was to, to just teach, to be able to show them what I had done over the years. So I would get on the phone with customers, take care of customers, run out back, help pack it up, really kind of open their eyes as to, wow, this, you know, this guy's willing to jump in here and do anything. Um, I had to teach the outside sales guy how to approach his days and his weeks. Um, and uh, that was the first time that I actually had to encounter somebody that was really negative. Um, one of the people that worked there was removed twice, uh, so there was um, two managers in between. He ran the location, so having a young guy come in and, and it's going to turn things around, very negative, very against uh, the teamwork. Thankfully, he retired the following year, but my approach never changed. It was still to do the same things that we were doing. Fast forward to the next year, um, because we started turning things around in Miami, we moved our international business into Miami. That had also been struggling at the time. Unfortunately, <coughs> that too came with a problematic employee. Um, somebody that had been demoted into an outside sales role. So um, they didn't want to hear from me about how to approach their day. This person actually worked harder at not working than they actually did working. So, um, but I wouldn't give in. One of the things though that I did take away from that too, and, and some of the, the problem employees that I have is not everybody's going to be an A player on your team. Sometimes there's going to be B players and, and that's fine. Um, don't expect you out of everybody, but get the most out of what you can out of those people. I really tried with this second uh, problem employee and uh, just wasn't working. So she had uh, decided to move on at the end of, uh, so that was 2014 that she had moved on, 2013. Um, so then Cadillac, or, I'm sorry, Cadillac, Savick, we get a new president and he wants to go to this district model. And what that is, we would have a district manager running multiple locations. You would have the support of a sales manager and an operations manager. The sales people would report up through the sales manager. The warehouse people report up through the operations manager and both report into the district manager. So I'm running the South Florida, I get Puerto Rico, and the international business at that time. Uh, 20, well, in, so this is in 2015. So I, I decide not to hire a sales manager because I was going to spend most of my time in Miami. And I had gotten pretty good at, on the sales side, so I could save on that side. But I decided to hire my, um, my previous manager that I had in Harrisburg and in Philadelphia uh, to be my operations manager. So for the first time, I've got somebody that I reported to now reporting to me. So. Um, and this happens again in my career later on. And one of the things that I take out of that is just be careful how you treat people on the way up because you may meet them again on the way down. So um, always be mindful of how you, uh, how you treat people. Um, so 2015 comes and I'm running, uh, I'm going over a couple times a year to run the Puerto Rico location. And there was difficulty. The island was going bankrupt. The government wasn't paying taxes. Um, and it became difficult for us to be profitable out of that location. As a matter of fact, it became impossible for us to be profitable there. So for the first time in my career, um, I really had to do something that I really had a hard time doing. And I went over to the island, and I had to tell eight people that they were losing their job. Um, you know, it doesn't only affect the eight people there, also their families. But something that we needed to do. So 2016, I'm back in Florida. I'm running Florida and um, I'm running, I'm sorry, Miami and our international business. And North Florida, which was three locations as well, was not running so well. So 
we lumped Florida all together. So now I'm running Florida International. Um, I do take over, I do get a sales manager at that point. The person that was district manager was now going to become my sales manager. And then this is where the operations manager that was in North Florida was my former uh, boss in Orlando. He becomes my operations manager. And then we send Greg, who was the other operations manager, on to special projects. So again, this is where I had somebody reporting to me that I used to report to. So at the time in 2016, uh, Sabic wanted to sell off the distribution part of the business. Again, going back to when they, when they acquired us, all they really wanted was the resin part of the business. They didn't want the manufacturing or the distribution part of the business, but they kept, the, they kept us for about seven years um, uh, before they finally sold us off and we went to private ownership. Uh, before that happens, I'm asked to move back to Central Florida to be in the middle of the territory again. So this is the third house that I'm selling in five years, moving the family again. My kids are in high school now at this point, so stressful on the family as well. Uh, but it was definitely the right move because as we were sold, we went into what was called decentralization. So that was breaking apart of all of the districts that we put together. Under this model, uh, which was a profit sharing model, um, you were responsible for one location. You really had to give your focus to that one location to be successful. So a manager runs one location. We actually call them PCMs, profit center managers, because all of our locations are profit centers. Uh, just a little touch on what the profit share model is. So you have your sales and your cost of goods sold, so take that out. You've got all of your expenses that come down to an operating income. <laughs> We pay the owners off in uh, investment charges. So for our accounts receivable, our accounts payable, and all the inventory that we, that we have on the floor, we pay an investment charge to the owners. And you're left with this lump of money. 28% of it goes to the actual location. 12% goes to put profit share together for our corporate office. And the other 60% is reinvested back into the business acquisitions, equipment that we need, things like that. So we're told at this time, a uh, new president comes in that had been in this model before that profit sharing, if you do it correctly, can be life changing. Okay, you know, what, what does that mean? And they're, they're talking about people that run locations making hundreds of thousands of dollars. I say, okay, well, we'll see what this looks like. So I'm running Orlando. Um, and in, so it was late in 2016 that we were acquired. We couldn't get the financial structure together to do profit sharing until 2018. So we had the rest of 2016 and all of 2017 to really come into profit sharing on a clean sheet. Um, I used that time um, and the time that I had with the president who was very familiar with the model to really learn what key levers are there to pull in order to be successful? You can't have aged inventory on the floor. The longer you have the inventory on the floor, you're paying an investment charge for that every month. That was key. Dealing with uh, taking sales with low margins, um, you're not really putting anything to the bottom line. Not working with key suppliers, uh, that would work against you as well. So during this 15 month period, 2016 and 2017, um, I had fired low margin customers. I had fired uh, customers that paid us poorly. Uh, all these things that worked against us in this model. Um, and then we went into uh, 2018 on a clean sheet. I had mentioned before that we would meet with our shareholders once a year. So we have a forecast meeting. Mine's actually coming up in, in two weeks. That's when you spend time with the shareholders to tell them, this is what I'm doing with your business. This is how I'm going to give you a return on your investment. Um, we, there's about nine people that are in the room that are shareholders in this business that have been doing it for hundreds of years combined. Um, you really kind of understand at that point that they could give you some good advice. So it's really kind of 
learning what you can at this point um, and, and making the model work for you. Um, I actually threw away about $60,000 in bad inventory at that time. It's a little tough to go into the shareholder meeting after they bought you and say, well, what would you do um, as far as getting ready for this model? And to tell them, well, I took $60,000 of your money and I pitched it. You know, that's, uh, it took guts to do that, but they knew at that point that I understood how to make the model work for me and we'd get that return back. Uh, there was not a lot of managers that were willing to do that at that time. So we get into 2018, and we're in our first year. I've got 10 people at that location, and um, we do about $10 million in sales. Uh, we, we come away with about hundred or uh, $1.5 million in operating income. Um, after we paid our, uh, our shareholders uh, in investment charges, we came away with about $300,000 in profit share for the location that I was able to divide up amongst the people that worked there. It was important to do that in the first year because I, you know, my team didn't believe that this was going to be this life-changing life thing. So we, we, we do that in 2018. So it's equally important to do it again in 2019 because they had seen the goalpost move in the past with previous ownership. You could do it one year. They raised the bar so high, it's impossible to do it the next year. Not under this model. If, you, if your sales and margins are the same and you keep your costs relatively close to the same, you could pay out the same. We increased our sales by about a half a million dollars. We increased our operating income by about another 300,000. And we put over $400,000 into the profit share the second year. Fast forward to 2020, uh, you know what happened then, right? COVID hits. I'm running Orlando. We are very reliant on, I, I've got a large aerospace customer in South Africa. Aerospace had taken a downturn. There was a lot of trouble with the Boeing 737 that they supported. Um, we also support trade show heavily in Orlando, as well as uh, theme parks. So it was uh, Disney World, Universal, all that. Crowds go away in 2020. I'm thinking, my God, with aerospace going and this going, my business is going to crash. I'm not going to make any money this year. So we start brainstorming, and uh, we start using the equipment that we have. We have routers in Orlando. We said, well, what can we do differently? And we start coming up with shields, the partitions that you guys have seen for the last couple of years that have finally gone away, right? That was uh, massive over the course of 2020. The biggest problem that uh, came about in 2020 was lead times on see-through materials went from being uh, readily available to went as far as 26 weeks out. So if you weren't on the front end of ordering material, we took some chances in Orlando. You could really be left behind and not have product on the floor to sell. Everybody wanted clear material. So, um, we were smart enough. We took some risk, but we didn't go too heavy because I didn't want to be left with a ton of material at the end that I'd be paying investment charges on. Um, we took a step back in sales that year, but because we had the equipment that we needed, um, we were able to make the partition. So our sales dropped by about $2 million, but our, our operating income went up. Um, so we made the most of what we, uh, what we had there on slides here so um, so then the end of 2020 comes around and my regional manager at the time is retiring um, one, one part that I skipped in there through 2020 um, it was a lot of the brainstorming that we did and sharing ideas uh, my president at the time who's our current president now put together a COVID task force and it was really a group that could come together and share ideas of what they were doing when the region manager position opened up, I interviewed for that position. And um, that was the biggest thing that he said, put it over the top for me getting this position was the way that I shared ideas then. And my approach to that, he needed me to do that for the 10 locations in the Southeast. So January 1st, 2021, I take over as the region director for the Southeast, uh, and that's the position that I'm still in today. So I support 10 locations in the Southeast. 
from Charlotte or Charlotte and Raleigh down through Miami and then over to uh, uh, Louisiana. Um, it's been pretty rewarding uh, for me to be able to get these 10 locations thinking similar to the way we did in Orlando. Um, like I said, this model, if you work it properly, it does work for you um, and it can be rewarding. So uh, to wrap things up here, uh, just some of the key takeaways. Develop the cadence, be better than everybody else. Uh, work hard, as you heard that from John this morning. Take some risks. Um, calculate your risk, but take some risks. Um, show up early and stay late. Pretty easy, uh, pretty easy to do. Um, earn your spot. Nobody owes you anything. Own your career. And I am not a public speaker, but I thought that uh, when this was asked of me to do this, uh, one of the things that I say to my team all the time is get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So this is uncomfortable for me to do this, but um, I'm happy to come in and spend time with you guys. So I appreciate you having me. And uh, if there's any questions, fire away. You may want to go up and introduce yourself. Oh, is there a touch back there? I missed it. Go for it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Since you can see the gym. Yep, yep. Yes. Well, I, I, like I said, I had the advantage of handling the material. Um, I really hadn't been in any kind of cell position at all before that. Um, even coming out of high school, I wasn't, wasn't sure what I was. I said, I excelled in math courses, so I was good at numbers. So, I, you know, it kind of came natural on the number side, but, you know, having the, uh, you know, the experience of handling the materials and knowing how it cuts, knowing how we ship it and things like that really kind of, kind of helped me out. Have you ever dreamt it? So, I, I mean, there's a lot of twists and turns in your career, yeah. but, was, but you still feel like moving forward. I was wondering, what motivators, other than your family, of course, but what, what helped you stay on track and just kept you grounded? A uh, couple, couple key leaders that I had um, during my career. Like I said, be, when I took the position to go from outside sales in Orlando to Miami, I, I resisted that for about six months. It was my boss that had seen it in me that I could do more than that. I'm so thankful now because had I not done that, I might just about be getting my first crack at being a manager in Orlando. Um, it's really having some of the people along the way that, that can see uh, that you can do more, um, you know, that was big for me, but definitely the support of my family. Um, it was tough moving the kids through some of that. When we moved down to Miami, my son had just started high school, and one of the things that he had asked when we got down there was just, no more moving, let me get through high school. And then two years later, we had to do it again. Um, so I, I went to him before. We, we made this decision as a family. Like I said, my wife's always said, whatever you need to do, we'll, we'll figure it out. So um, I went and I talked to my son. I was like, if we could get you back into the same school district that you were in before, would that work? Because that was an option for me. I could move back to where we were, which is where we are now. And he said, yeah, yeah, that'll work. So it was compromise there too. Um, it was probably tougher on my daughter that year because she was just going into high school. So she was a cheerleader, miss cheerleader tryouts and things like that. So I didn't get to do that in her freshman year. But um, yeah, just the right, the right people. I mean, believe in yourself. You know, John had said that in there as well. Uh, absolutely true. Believe in yourself, but you know, listen to the coaches that you have along the way um, because you can get some, some good advice from the right people. Kind of like what we talked about in class, how sometimes you just need someone to nudge you, even though maybe you don't think it's something you do well at, but when someone kind of pushes you, like, hey, I think you'd be really good at this, and you give it a try, more often than not, you'll be surprised that, crap, maybe, I'm, maybe I can sell. Kind of happened to me. <laughs> right before COVID started, too, um, the president of the company called me. He was like, so, you think about being regional manager at all? Nah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm at home in my bed every night. I'm doubling my salary as a PCM. You know, why would I do that? And then it was through 
that whole task force too that I saw that as well that I can help other people be successful so instead of 10 people that work for me in in Orlando I've got 80 people that I'm responsible for in the southeast region so um, yeah it's just a lot more rewarding and now my kids are college my son's out of college now my daughter's a, a in her third year at Florida Atlantic. So it's a lot easier for me to, to not be home. I travel a lot as a Southeast manager. So um, I'm on a plane almost every every week. I'm usually traveling from Tuesday to Thursday. So um, you know, my wife does work. So it's, it's a little easier now. If I was gonna try to do that when the kids were small, that, that'd have been a lot tougher to do, so. Uh, what were your motivators of transition? So, like, do you want to go to these positions to learn or to make more money or, like, to reach a specific point? Or what questions yeah. did you ask your parents about that? Um, I didn't really have a, a goal of a position to get to. Um, money is always a motivator, right? It's, uh, you know, tough having, you know, two little kids and a mortgage. And, you know, and so I, I've lived paycheck to paycheck before. So, Money's always a motivator, but um, you know, just learning, like I mentioned, you want to be somebody that's hard to replace. Never think that the company can't replace you, even if it takes them two people. You can be replaced, but be somebody that it's tough for them to replace. Um, yes, yeah, so that was the, the biggest you know motivator for me was to learn it all and be somebody. I, I could still unload a truck today. I mean, we, we joke about it when I'm in Orlando, but. I could hop on a forklift and unload the truck, you know, if, if that's what it's uh, that's what required. You had a second part to that question, or uh, so what questions did you ask? There? In interviews, um, really, what people want to do. Um, that's probably the biggest thing for me when I sit down with somebody is, where do you want to get to? I can help you get there if I know where you want to get to. So, so I had the first conversation with me, and I said I want to do recruiting, and that was years before I got into this but it was nice to like he talked to people and they helped get me there when well, if, if you're not happy in the job that you're doing change it really um, but if if you want to get to someplace specific you know, let me let me help you get there really if, if you're in sales and you're miserable in sales or it's just not the thing that you want to do find what you want to do um, you know, that was the other thing John said he, he's got a passion for what he does um, have fun at work, it's, it's not really work. So. Uh, all right. Thank all you. Right. I appreciate Thank you guys you. having me.